Welcome to another episode of Sports and Songs podcast. This is season two, episode number 21. We're your co-hosts, Dan and Andy. Andy, how are you doing tonight? Doing good, doing good. How about yourself? Well, uh, good. It's, it's a Friday. It's April 16th. Uh, it's a Friday evening we're doing the show. Uh, uh, got back from going out to dinner. At a, I tried a new restaurant tonight uh, out in Western Carver County. We went to uh, Norwood called okay. the Northside Grill, the Northside oh, Grill okay. and Bar. And I've never been there before and had a big, big meaty burger. It was, uh, it was the Northside Burger, it was called. The okay. local, it was the... Uh, the the official the house, burger. House burger yeah. It was a house burger. Uh, yeah. Very good. Well, we're going to try to hit a lot of the uh, towns that have amateur baseball here. And uh, once the season gets in full swing, try out some of these locations before or after the game. But uh, we just did that for Friday night and uh, just got home. It, it was good. Well, like we said, our pre-show production meeting, three o'clock here in uh, the Watertown. Uh, local team opened up against St. Louis Park. So... Yeah, the local, it's the Watertown Red Devils. They went to state last year. They're playing their home opener this Sunday against St. Louis Park, and that should be a good ball game. I'm going to that. I plan on being there. We'll, I'll be able to report uh, after that game is over. But yeah. this, this Wednesday midweek edition, I did the part two of the, Car, the Crow, R- River, Crow River Valley League South Division preview. And so there's a part one out there. It's about 10 minutes long. There's a part two out there for the uh, – one, one episode was the North Division. One was the South. They're each about 10 minutes. Very quick, very short, but a good, good concise preview of what I call the best conference uh, league, league in baseball in the state of Minnesota, a Crow River Valley League. Very good, uh, talented group. And they kick off you know, this Sunday. There's four games going on on yeah. Sunday. The rest of the teams get into action the following weekend. I remember the, the field where the, the Red Devils play is where we had uh... – Abby's graduation party. Yes. And I, when we signed it up, I said, hey, this was like four months out, five months out. I said, hey, I want a pencil and want to use that. She goes, sure. She goes, as long as the baseball team doesn't schedule a game then too, because she goes, they do get priority. <laughs> Not yeah, a problem. A, a lot of renovations there a couple of years ago, and uh, yep. the focus is on that baseball uh, team and that baseball field. It's a nice setup there, but also very good to host uh, other events, community events. Yep. Yeah, the, uh, our rails to trail stuff, they do a lot of stuff up there too. So a lot of things are held up there. It's a pretty nice area. I'll report but, live on that, but uh, that's all I've got to start off the show. Where do you want to start tonight? Uh, trivia question. All right. Trivia question. Almost forgot. The trivia question this week is the player for the White Sox. I don't know the name. Oh, um, I had it written down here. Just had it written down. Uh, Who had the, he, had the, he had the no hitter. He threw the no hitter this week. In base, Carlos Rendon, and, and so Rendon uh, hits a batter in the ninth inning, I think, and, and doesn't get a perfect game, but still gets the no hitter. What? And so the question is, the question for this week was, when was the last perfect game thrown in Major League Baseball, and and who threw it? That's the question. Oh, you know, and getting to Rendon here real quick before we start the rest of the show. Here's the thing: like a lot of guys, and this is no rip on anybody, but Rendon going into that game. 31 and 33 career record. It's not always the big name stars who throw the no hitter. Um, a 4.4, 4.04 ERA. In that game, he had seven Ks, hit the one guy, no walks, and 114 pitches. Um, and he just he was battling for the number five position coming out of spring training on that team. He's just coming off Tommy John surgery. That Syndergaard's is. going off Tommy John surgery this year, folks. That is incredible, and uh, to so come back comes close. Off back but you're right. It doesn't always have to be the Cy Young Award winner, the top, the yep. big name, the 20-game winner. Uh, if someone gets going on a rhythm and gets cruising along and you're unable to hit that night. Uh, Chris, Eric Milt threw no hitter. You're in the major leagues uh, for a reason, so any of these guys can, can pull off something like this once you get to that level. But amazing. I mean, for the Twins, Eric Milton threw no hitter. Yes. Now, granted, it might have been towards the end of the year when you got the call-ups, but I don't care what level you are. No hitter is a no hitter. Yes, true. Huge. Uh, perfect game, of, no of course. Hitters. Perfect game, of course, is perfect, but a no hitter is so unbelievably hard to do at the major league level that it's uh, it's amazing. And we see a couple of them a year, don't we? We've seen two already. Two this year already. So it happens, but it's unbelievable. So the question well, is, about, 
the last what about Hope Treadwin? That girl from North Texas, Hope Treadwin. I wanted to bring that up also. Now, softball, women's softball, they play seven innings, which is fine. Uh, I, I'm wounded after three, so I'm impressed with seven. So that's she, perfect game. 21 outs. I'm sorry, 21 strikeouts. So think of it, think of it this way for the listeners out there. Um, yes, it's tough to do seven inning game. You have a perfect game. That's three outs an inning, seven innings. That's 21 outs. She struck out all 21 batters, meaning yep. the ball was never put into play. Yeah. Fair territory at all. No walks, no, no hit batters. There was no, no walk, walks, hits, uh, nothing. She struck out every player on the team. That is amazing. And, uh, and it's from North Texas University, right? Yep. Yep. And here's the thing where watching women's softball, just watching it, my arm hurts watching the way those girls throw. Yeah. I mean, so just to do what she did, incredible. So a, 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 not a single ball was put into play by the opposing team in that entire game. Not a ground yeah. out, not a fly out. Not, not a pop a dribbler, Not a lame duck uh, a fly, yep. a quail to the outfield. Nothing was put into play. Not a punt. Yep, yep. And you figure after a while, someone's going to try something just to break it out, but nothing. That is. Because he's a lot of fucking softball, which is fine, but no, nothing. That is unbelievable. So, yes, I want to make sure we talked about that on tonight's show. So that's the trivia question. When was the last perfect game? Not no hitter, but perfect game thrown in Major League Baseball uh, history. Um, so that's the question. We'll cover that later, the answer. All right. Here we go. So, uh, stuck here. Second. Oops. Getting to uh, high school baseball. So talk about their ratings and stuff here. Here we go. Awesome. I can see it. Class, yeah. Yeah, class four. Now, records, yes, they're 0-1, but it's the first week. It's baseball. It's not like basketball and hockey where one loss and you drop tons of spots, okay? And if you notice here, some of these schools are in the 4A. St. Michael Albertville at six. I think they're like two or three A for every other sport, but baseball, they're 4A. So good for them. But here's 4A. Moundsview is one. There's been a talk at three. Uh, Farmington was out of Moorhead, rounding off the top 10. Class 3A, Hill Murray, St. Thomas Academy. Kind of your basic cast of characters for 3A stuff. There's Waconia at 8, Bemidji at 9. Again, some schools not played, some are 2-0. We'll, we'll figure it out later in the season. We're early yet. Um, and these are just more or less names to watch out for. So here's 2A, Minnehaha Academy with their 0-3. I haven't seen their schedule who they lost to. Don't know. They could have lost to Bell Plain there. They're 3-0. Who knows? Early in the season, just kind of watch these names as the year goes on. If they're one of your hometown teams, there's Bell Plain. Uh, 1A, there's New York Mills at 1. Uh, Hancock at 4. Uh, Randolph at 9. So there's some good teams in there. They're your local teams. Give them a watch. We'll see how they're doing. Um, speaking of high school sports, let's backtrack to the boys' basketball. Congratulate the champions, A. Hayfield won the A division over Hancock. Two was uh, two A was Wasika over Caledonia. Three A Minnehaha Academy beat Alexandria, eighty to twenty nine. And then in four A Wyzetta beat Great Durham Hall. So congratulations to those boys for their championships. Um, college baseball. There's the standings for that. Um, you see right there. There's the Gophers bringing up the bottom. Uh, they've had their games in the greenhouse down there. They'll start playing at Seabrook here pretty soon. Um, tough year for the Gophers this year. I think it's going to be a long season for the boys, but still, college baseball, very fun, very exciting to watch. Um, so there's, there's the names there. Girls softball, though, here's the Gophers. Whoops. Gophers at two. Um, they're doing very well this year, 19-5 and five for the women there. So, again, if you're into softball, go watch them. If you're into baseball, go watch the boys down on, on campus. Fun, good times all around on campus to watch any sport, really. Um, go for Ben. Go for schedule. Here's stuff for Friday night. Um, the gymnastics semifinals are going on. Uh, the girls did not advance. They uh, lost in the round of eight. Um, so congratulations to them. Individual stuff's going on, but team-wise, they're done. Uh, you can check other things here. 
you always go to the Gopher site, gophersports.com. As you can see, live results, um, baseball lost to Michigan. Uh, and tomorrow, you could watch your games, live results. Yeah, if you're into the track and field or the golf, you can always follow it here. Um, rowing, there's tennis against Wisconsin, softball, Nebraska, baseball again with Michigan. So there's that. Sunday, more of the same. Volleyball, Pittsburgh's in town. Men's tennis is with Iowa. So there's those. If you're heading up north, Bison Country. Uh, play, they uh, lost Oral Roberts today. And uh, the game with Iowa State softball was canceled. Um, then tomorrow, they had a chance of revenge. There's a game against the Bunnies uh, that got moved. It's a 2-30 game. Uh, that's always a tough game. South Dakota State, North Dakota State. It, it, it's like a Viking Packer type rivalry for football. Without sounding too cliche, throw the records out the book, out the door. You know, the, the, it's always a fun game. Uh, ESPN Plus, um, I know down here, I can't remember the station, but you can, can pick up Bison games on the radio here. Or again, just go to gobison.com and you can uh, get the live audio, live video, follow along here. Uh, there's more baseball with the Oral Roberts. Softball against Iowa State. Track and field with uh, Minnesota State University Moorhead, the Dragons. So there's all that information there for them. And then our friends at Bemidji State. Here we go on the 10th. Last week of their softball. Here they got golf. They're doing very well in their uh, championships. They're second right now after one day. See, tied for second out of 10. Um, so they got golf going on tomorrow, track and field, softball against Winona State, baseball at Southwest Minnesota. And so uh, there's stuff for the Beavers. Other things to talk about, like I said, uh, go for women. Did make the NCAA tournament for college gymnastics. They did not do well today. They are out in the semifinals here. But again, congratulations to them. Been following them a lot all year on social media. Very exciting to watch. Again, it's kind of like watching girls softball. I just I hurt watching these people bend and twist and move like that. That's just not right. But um, that's just the fat white guy in me coming out. I can't do that. So it's, it, that's what impresses me most is watching these things that I know I can't do. Golf, volleyball, gymnastics. Just amaze me the, the stuff they can do. Uh, but if you want to follow them on their site, see how they did. Now, there's one thing here for baseball. Put this up. This guy from Fox Sports put up five potential cities for expansion. If he, he hit his pick. Now, Dan and I came up with our own list of five. And for whatever reason, I mean, tried to be fairly serious about it. But five cities for expansion for baseball. My five in no particular order. I just kind of looked at the map and kind of looked around, stuff like that. I got Vancouver, British Columbia as a spot. So I'm kind of thinking rivalry for Seattle and also more West Coast teams, just trying to spread that out. Salt Lake City, Utah. I thought it would be interesting. They've held the Olympics there. They've got facilities for it. They've got minor league there. I, I, I have no problem with that for Salt Lake City. New Orleans, I think, would be a nice spot for Major League Baseball. Um, it's kind of close to Houston, so there might be a little issues with that, but I'd be okay with New Orleans as a uh, site for baseball. Montreal, of course. Um, they Kind of like when Minnesota lost hockey. It's kind of wrong how Montreal lost baseball, but anyway. And then Winnipeg. And that was kind of my, my really out there on the limb one for Winnipeg. If we get more baseball in Canada, Montreal or Vancouver would be nice. Um, but maybe Winnipeg because it's kind of middle of the territory there. Um, travel would be easier because it's just straight north from Minnesota, stuff like that. Uh, the Dakota fans come to here a lot, so give them another option for games too. Not that we don't welcome the North Dakota money into our state for their games, but another option. Uh, Winnipeg's had their minor league team playing with the Saints before this with the Northern League, so it's worked. They're, they're, it's a good city. But those are my five. Who did you have, young man? Oh, I had the, the same one there as you mentioned, uh, Winnipeg. Winnipeg yep. baseball, I think, would be a great location for Major League Baseball. It doesn't get talked about 
much. But then again, and my picks are a little off the cuff here, but I do agree. Nashville is on my list. Yep. Uh, Major League Baseball. Uh, and I've got two other Canadians for my picks uh, to go on next before my final pick. Calgary. Calgary, oh, yeah. Alberta could be a great location for Major League Baseball. I've got Edmonton as well as another location for a, for a Major League Baseball team. And my final pick is Green Bay, Wisconsin. Oh. Have them play in Lambeau Field. Convert the stadium for baseball. A lot of fans up there. They got to yes. drive many hours to get all the way down to Milwaukee. But Wisconsin doesn't have a baseball team in the heart of the state. It's basically on the border of Illinois, right? So right. Um, I would say Green Bay would be a fun pick to have a Major League Baseball game up there. Imagine the tailgating before the games. Whew. Oofta. Oofta. Oh. Now, um, the only thing I want to say on this topic is that I, I feel that because Montreal lost their team, yep. uh, I didn't include them on uh, because I'd rather not see a team back there. If, you know, they, if they lost it, they, they, I'm not a big fan of – it's like Seattle and basketball. You know, they don't have an NBA team. The Supersonics are gone. Now what? The, the Minnesota Wild owners may perhaps take them and, or even get an expansion in Seattle for, for NBA. Yeah. I'm not a fan well, of going back to cities where you already had it, your chance. Well, we had North Stars, and now we got a team back. But that was because the owner up and moved them. Kind of like – That's a different – Indianapolis. That's a different uh, game you with that. But uh, Depends on why you left. I guess yeah, depends. Yeah, but that's that's my picks for that. Um, some other sports notes there. I heard today. Uh, Dwayne Wade, D Wade, as some people call him. I just D call Wade. him Dwayne. I just call him Dwayne. We're kind of nice. we're not that close. Um, he is becoming partial owner of the Utah Jazz, so he's going to dip into that. Um, a Rod, of course, getting into the Timberwolves. Um, sorry guys, J Lo won't be here. They're getting a divorce. So A Rod, he goes from trying to get the Mets canned, so he settles for the Timberwolves. A little confused on that one. <laughs> well, the only thing that I could I could give my opinion is that he's got so much extra cash and and money for tax reasons. Maybe his tax accountant may have said you should make some sort of investment in something and mm. set your money away in an investment. And he thought, why not get into professional? Sports. I don't think it's because of the love for the Timberwolves. I, I right. Think. I don't know if he's a big basketball fan or not. I don't know. And it's not anything to do with J-Lo. They both got their own billions of dollars. It's not a hide the money group for the divorce thing. It's not that. It's just uh, a write-off. And a lot of athletes you're getting, um, Marshawn Lynch is buying into the Oklahoma soccer team. A lot of athletes are buying in. Michael Jordan owns a NASCAR team with uh, Denny Hamlin. Bubba Wallace drives for them. So a lot of other athletes are getting in, which is great. You, you, you got overpaid for playing a kid's game anyway, and I'll give it back. Fine. Um, but I guess some of these guys, like with Dwayne Wade, the Utah Jazz, I, wow. Went to school, college at Marquette, pro in Miami, and buys the Utah Jazz. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but good for him on that. Um, I saw some states, the NCAA – is stepping in on this uh, transgender athlete thing where uh, if your state does some of high schools for transgenders where you don't allow it, the NCAA won't let you host national championships anymore. So, uh, fine. You know, we'll see, how that, we'll see how well that goes over. Um, and then the Olympics are coming up. Uh, this last week was their 100-day countdown before the Olympics. Um, opening ceremonies are July 23rd. Now, like both sets of Olympics, summer and winter, yeah, they go for a couple weeks, but still, that's not long enough. Actually, July 20th, softball starts, and the 20, uh, I think the 21st, soccer starts, but the opening ceremonies aren't until the 23rd. So some of these sports like that they have, where they have a series of games they play, it's not like one event, you know, to determine it. So softball starts the 20th. Baseball, the 27th starts. Now, one thing I understand from uh, the Japanese Baseball League, what they're doing is during the Olympics, they're suspending the season, kind of like the NHL used to do for hockey. So the few Americans that play in Japan professionally 
can play for Team USA during the Olympics. So since they're already there. Okay. That many less guys got to have travel. That many less guys got to worry about quarantining. The guy's already there. So we'll see how many of those guys make team, how they work that. Um, be kind of interesting. So that's coming up. And here's my thing. Let me get my other picture here before I get right here. Um, some of the other sports that have, they have three on three basketball. They have beach volleyball. They have golf. And... They don't have bowling. Now I'm on my soapbox. Are you kidding me? Three on three basketball. I can go to the park and watch any three on three basketball. And these aren't going to be, it's going to be like the old uh, white man can't jump, Sam, or uh, blacktop basketball type games. Not a lot of fundamental passing in like you would see in the regular Olympic stuff. Um, beach volleyball, I've never been a fan of. Never been a fan of beach volleyball because, again, I'm not. I'd rather see the regular volleyball inside the way the way God intended it to be played. Golf, again, it's like tennis in the Olympics. It's just another stop on their tour. It, I, now, granted, you could say the same thing about bowling. It'd just be another stop on the tour. But bowling is one of those sports, too, kind of like with the golf and with the tennis, where around the world it's the same thing. Fall on the head pin 60 feet, 10 pins, 16-pound ball. It, it's basically the same all over. I dare you to argue with me that bowlers are not athletes. The number, Look at what they got to do for the U.S. Open, how many games they bowl a week for that. I will argue with you that bowling is more of a sport than curling. I wrote a paper in, in high school on why curling is not a sport. Compared to other things like like bowling or like baseball, or who just got back in the Olympics. Olympics, you really drop. They want to make break dancing an Olympic sport. Really? We're not going to have bowling? Come on. Don't, don't push me, boys. Don't push me. Um, my person of the week this week, um, coming up on an anniversary of his for something he did here, Picture the original big train, not Carl Willis from the Twins. The original big train, Walter Johnson. This week back in 1926, at the age of 28, he pitched his seventh opening day shutout. Not his seventh opening day win, his seventh opening day shutout. Um, here's just some stuff about Walter Johnson. Just... Um, He's most celebrated dominating pitcher in baseball history, established winning several pitching records, some which remain unbroken during his 21 careers, 21 career with the Washington Senators. That's known. He was a nice guy too. He wasn't a, uh, he was just known as a nice guy. Too. Everybody loved him. Uh, he ended up passing away of a brain tumor of all things. So here's just some historical events that happened in his career. Off Walter Johnson um, began his career at 19. Uh, lost his first game 3-2 to two to, Detro to Detroit. Um, he got his first win of his 416 career wins with Washington. Uh, it was a 7-2 win over Cleveland. Uh, he was a pitcher. He got the final victory for the New York Islanders before being waived and claimed by the Red Sox. Um, Jack Tresbo, he beat Walter Johnson in the 2-1. So he's played back with the New York Highlanders are still a team. Uh, Walter Johnson, he's uh, tied the record of four strikeouts in an inning, which happens if the strike three is a pass ball, runner goes to first, so you get a chance for that fourth out. So he's had four strikeouts in an inning. Uh, he has a record for 15 straight. Um, he won 15 straight, beat the Cleveland Naps, which is what the Cleveland Indians were. They used to be called the Naps. Um, four to two. In the nightcap, uh, the Carl Cushion of the Naps, no him. So, uh, Walter Johnson had a 16 game winning streak. Um, some other things. Uh, uh, December 4th, 1914, Walter Johnson accepts money from the Federal League Chicago Whales. Clark Griffith threatens to take Johnson to court. 
Yes. Clark Griffin, Calvin Griffin, Minnesota Twins, that family. Um, and a testament on his pitching ability, future Hall of Famer, Slugger Babe Ruth leads the Boston Red Sox to a one nothing victory against. So, one nothing. Babe Ruth is one of the touchdown in that game. Um, 12 scoreless innings in the famous 0 0 tool with Jack Quinn of the Yankees at the Polo Grounds. 12 innings. Takes some pitchers four games to get that now. Um, you know, here's just uh, some of his. Uh, uh, the first players elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame were Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, Honus Wagger, Christy Matheson, and Walter Johnson. Uh, I got some stats here for you to kind of put it in perspective for uh, modern day, in a way, if you will. Here he is. Um, there's Walter Johnson there. There's him with Babe Ruth that did a charity thing. Uh, he, Babe was in his late 40s. Walter was in his 50s. One at bat. Polo grounds. Um, here's Walter Johnson, born November 6th, 1887. Died December 10th, 1946. Um, made his last appearance with the Senators in 27. 417 wins, 279 for losses. 110 shutouts. And like I said, you look at his record. Now look at these numbers over here. World Series champion, 24. Two-time AL MVP, 1913 and 1924. He made his career start in 1907. So he has first MVP six years in. His last appearance was in 27. In 24, he got MVP, triple crown, led the league. In. So only three years where he was done, he was still top of his game. Six times was an AL leader in wins, five times an ERA, 12 times strikeout leader, uh, pitched the one no-hitter July 1st. 1920, um, all-century team, all-time team, Washington National, Nationals Ring of Honor. That's the one that kind of burrs me a little there. It's like when the Minnesota Wild retired uh, Neil Broughton and Mike Madonna's numbers. They never played here. And the Senators went to become the Minnesota Twins. And there was a second set of teams, those Washington Senators. They're now the Texas Rangers. You're the Washington Nationals. You're different. Don't touch our players. Um, here's some stats comparing Walter Johnson to Nolan Ryan. Wins, Walter Johnson at 417, Nolan Ryan at 324. Walter Johnson had less losses, not by many, though, uh, 279 to 292. So, of course, he had the better winning percentage. Games, so as, as a reliever and starter, games. Nolan Ryan did have more, 807 to 802. Starts, you see the difference in starts there, because Nolan Ryan did start as a reliever. Uh, he did pitch in the 69 World Series for the Mets out of the bullpen. And Walter Johnson, at the end of his career, went to the bullpen. ERA, Walter Johnson, 2.17. Uh, endings pitched, almost almost 6,000 for Walter Johnson. Hits allowed, now Walter Johnson gave up a lot more hits. Um, Nolan Ryan there gave up almost 4,000 hits. Runs allowed, uh, Nolan Ryan beat him by 2,000, which is not a stat you want to beat him in. Uh, ERA, or earned runs allowed. Uh, Walter Johnson, 1424, Nolan Ryan, 1911. Home runs allowed, 97 to 321. Uh, but then there's strikeouts, Nolan Ryan, the king right there. Now, some other stats from Walter Johnson. He's second all time in wins with 417, behind Cy Young with 511. Those two are going to win two forever, and no one's ever touching those. Uh, innings pitched, he's third, like I said, with 59-14. Uh, Cy Young was first with 7,356 innings pitched. Now, these were all stats be before last year they Major League Baseball acknowledged the Negro Leagues because we don't know Satchel Page what his real numbers were. I'm pretty sure him and Cy Young were pretty, pretty neck and neck on a lot of these. Um, strikeouts, he's ninth all-time with 3,508. Nolan Ryan was first there with 5719. But shutouts, he's first with 110. Second on the list, I didn't write that. Second on the list was 90. You don't see many guys throw shutouts anymore. Um, like I said, you don't see guys go past six. Seven innings is a incredible thing nowadays. Um, so his complete games with shutouts, those are, again, stats you'll never see. With Walter Johnson, the big train. Um, you get a chance to see stats of his on YouTube or games from him. I suggest you look it up. 
Uh, they've had a couple of books on him. Great man, great pitcher. Just that genre of baseball is not going to be touched again. Those some of those numbers we'll never see matched. Um, I, you could say, but they're better athletes today. You know, Jacob Degrom's a better athlete. Um, Max Scherzer's a better athlete. All these other pitchers are better athletes compared to the guys back then. You're a better athlete pitching nine innings. Um, you, you look back to the 91 World Series, Jack Morris against Smoltz. You'll never see a game like that again. You won't see a guy go long. Because it happened in uh, 2015 with the Mets. They pulled Matt Harvey in the ninth. Matt Harvey was fine. It's the World Series. Let him go to his arm falls off. Nope. Metrics say you got to be pulled. Don't cost them that's the World Series. <laughs> so as much as a number of geek I am, not a big cyber cyber metrics guy though either. But uh, and speaking of the Mets, uh, snowed out again today. Uh, so Jacob Degrom will be pitching tomorrow for a doubleheader, first part of a doubleheader, which is good news because with doubleheaders being only seven innings now instead of nine. That's less of a chance to, for the bullpen to blow a lead for Jacob this year, which I get the number they gave you last week. Jacob's had a tough time with that. I call him Jacob. We're close. Um, I, I just feel bad for guys like him. He, Nolan Ryan one year was 8-16 and 16 and was like third in the league in the ERA or first in the league in the ERA, but was 8-16. and 16. You know, so it's – it's not that Jacob's not getting the run support. He is, but then the bullpen blows it. But he's had a lot of one, two run leads going in. Bullpen's not having up. Mets have lost the, they lost the first three games due to COVID. They make those up. And then it's like their fourth game they've missed because of weather now, which is kind of good. It's got a couple guys at Syndergaard and Cookie coming back after off injury this summer. Hopefully the bullpen can get worked out or they can make some moves that they have to from the minors. But they're going to have a lot of games to make up. That's going to be tough on that pitching staff, which isn't looking good in the bullpen right now at all. It looks kind of kind of sad. Some of the guys, they moved away. Wheeler is doing good in Philadelphia. Um, you know, so other guys have gone out from the, from the bullpen. They're doing okay elsewhere. Going to be a long summer. Uh, going to be a long summer. So I apologize now if I get a little feisty later in the year looking at the standings. But the Mets are technically in first place right now, so life is good. Um, the Twins, on the other hand, have had a bad week. I mean, they won yesterday, walk-off fashion. Nice way to leave for a road trip. But Boston came in with their hair on fire, man. They took three in a row. They came in here, beat us like they were, we were their little brother. and um. It's going to be a long year for the Twins. I think they got a little spoiled last year. The Twins only lost seven games at home last year. We only played 30 games at home to start with, or whatever the short schedule was. So don't get too excited about your numbers there. Um, they've already lost five at home right now for the Twins. I think they'll be okay. They just got to – okay, first of all, breaking news, I'm not a big Miguel Sano fan. He's got to go. He's got to go. He's got to maybe – DH for a while, still playing first and DH. Do something. He, he – something's not clicking. That happened to uh, – was, was I think it was Morneau. Early in his career, it wasn't clicking. They sent him to the minors for two weeks, came back up, boom, kicked him around. Now, I know you go to some guys down so often with the AAA teaming in St. Paul. You not bring Mano on a – Sano on a field trip? See what happens. Maybe have him stay back. Um, I don't know. I, I really like uh, with Donaldson out. Guy playing third for us, filling in. Been doing great. I'd love to see that bat stay in the lineup. I'm eating crow every day. Buxton's doing it great this year. Um, maybe Snow could DH. I know you got you got Cruz. You give Cruz a glove and see how well he plays first. Just one day a week. Just to see what, how it works. I don't know. Do you trade Sano? Do you try to get something for him? Do you trade Cruz to get pitching for him and put Sano to the DH? We shall see. We shall see. Um, 
We haven't covered Australian baseball or Japanese baseball much this year yet. Uh, we will because we had we actually had high school sports talked about here in March and April. So we covered that a lot. Uh, coming up the next few weeks, we will have more Australian and Japanese baseball stats and news for you. Speaking okay. of our, one, our friends in the Australian League. Yeah. I got, one, I got one thing for Australian baseball. Yes. The Twins this week heading off to Los Angeles play a uh, weekend series at the Angels. Tonight's pitcher, Friday night this is, is Lewis Thorpe. They brought him up from the alternative training site. Uh, former Australian drafted by the Twins. So yep. Seven, eight years in the minors up and down. Uh, has been called up. He has 19 appearances in the major leagues in the last two years. So he's he's been up and down. He may be you know, close to uh, out of options. So uh, they brought him up for I, what I believe is to be is just a spot start for tonight. Yep. I'll send him back down. They've, they've got no injuries or anything that I, I know of. But I think with the doubleheader and everything, they needed some depth. So they brought up him, former Australian, uh, uh, very good pitcher. You know, Twins also drafted Liam Hendricks and then used him for some time and then uh, he bounced around a couple teams, and then he was the, uh, I think, the save leader of the year last year yep. in Major League Baseball. So, very yeah. good. Those are two Australian guys that I can think of. But Now, well, what do you think, okay, for, for extra innings this year, I mean, for doubleheaders, it's seven innings, so they can get games in, COVID reasons. But here's the thing that, that, that kind of confuses me. Okay, so you cut it down to seven innings, but they also allow teams during doubleheaders to expand their rosters by one. Well, you just took four innings away from a game. Granted, it's a doubleheader, it's a two games. They get to add an extra batter so, or an extra, an extra position player. Be a pitcher or a batter, I guess. Um, we'll see how that works out. Um, the other pitcher coming up, I don't know when the Twins start playing National League teams again. If there'll be an issue there. We shall see. I know... Um, I said the Mets, when they landed in Denver today, it was snowing. So and they got some snow there. And Denver just got done getting swept. So I think the day off is going to help them, which is not good. But the Grom's on the mound. Strowman will be soon after that. Hopefully we'll come out of there okay. I'd like to see the Mets stay around 500 for a while. I mean, if you look at Major League Baseball, you hit a 10-game winning streak, you will walk away with your division. I mean, 10 game winning streak, that puts you at, at what, 80, 86, well, 86 to 91 wins. That's that's first place easily, you know. So the Mets can still get a few tiny winning streaks or a big one here will be good. But so we got Cookie, we got Syndergaard coming back. I don't know who's going to go to make room for those. Um, right now, the bullpen by committee with that. You'll probably pull any two names out of there, and I'd be happy right now. I'm not, not on my Christmas card list those bullpen pitchers right now. Um, we'll see. It should be a, it, that, that's what makes it 162 games. you got to watch them all. We shall see. But that's what I got, sir. What do you have for a, a, a trivia answer for us? Speaking of well, the trivia, trivia answer. Trivia question was, um, when was the last Major League Baseball perfect game pitched in the majors? And the, uh, the answer was, you know, who, who did that and when? The answer is August of 2012 when Felix Hernandez, yes, King Felix, did it for the Mariners. Uh, toward the end of the season in August, back in 2012, they won one nothing over the Tampa Bay Rays. But King Felix was the last perfect game in the Major League Baseball, and that's coming up on nine, uh, nine years here. Now, the thing to note, Andy, is that there was three perfect games in that year, 2012. That's right. And the very first one of the year was in April. Also in Seattle's Safeco Field, this time the Seattle got beat by the White Sox when Philip Humber from the White Sox yep. get a perfect game against them. So the Mariners were involved in two perfect games in one single season at home. Two perfect game, not no hitters, perfect game. So King Felix is the answer to this week's uh, trivia question. Uh, the Seattle Mariners, back when Randy Johnson was there, um, threw no hitter one year. And also that same year, Nolan Ryan threw no hitter. And I know this because I got my brother lives out there watching. I remember, I remember this like yesterday. I'm telling you this. So the games come up where Nolan Ryan would be in town, and it was lined up Nolan Ryan against Randy Johnson. Their promotion that night was guaranteed no hitter night. 
why not? You know, nice. you got two guys who both threw no hitter that year. Throw it out there. But uh, yeah, no hitters. Okay, say it's a seven inning double header. Is that still a no hitter to you? They're ruling it that way because it's an official full length game. I mean, if it's one nothing after five and it rains, it's a no hitter. They've had a couple of those in history too. So yeah, it gets Ooh. interesting. It's interesting. Depends. If I got him on my fantasy team, yes, no hitter. Then it, then it counts. Yes. Then it counts. It's, it's gold. Uh, what do you have in your Sony oh. disc? Oh, yes. Got one last thing in sports. Um, doesn't relate to football season now. Oh, uh, yeah. But, but, it, but it would for next year. XFL, you know, took a year off with the COVID. Last year they played half a season. This year they're not going to play at all. Next year they're playing a full season. Uh, that starts around this time, March, April time frame, I think a 10 game season. They announced that they're playing with the idea. They're toying with the idea of having the champion when the season's done, the champion that was crowned play against the champion of the Canadian football league that year in a winner take all granddaddy champion, kind of a Super Bowl thing. So yep. look for that. That may come into play. But I've heard some issues. You know, we got field size yep. is different. Field size, uh, three downs instead of four. So your strategy is a little different there. Um, I'd like to see a little more partnership between XFL and CFL. Maybe they'll do preseason games, too, if they don't do that. They'll do something. Oh, that's, a, that's an option would be to get some uh, examples in there to, to kind of test the waters. But yeah. anyway, it's 2021 now. We're not worried about it yet, but uh, as, a, as the uh, official – I'm running the XFL stuff here on the show here for uh, for the Sports and Songs podcast. We'll be covering it heavily next year. Yes. And the, uh, just so you know, the XFL, Vince McMahon, I think he still owns like 5%, a little bit. But Dwayne The Rock Johnson owns most, a good part of the XFL too. Yes. So ex-athletes buying teams. He's the guy owning a league. So um, very interesting there. Uh, again, I think Dwayne did that. He, he, he was a college football player down at uh, Miami. He did get a cup of coffee in Canada for football. Um, so he does have football in his blood. So that's, uh, hey, I want to buy that from Vince and do my buddy a favor. No, he's a football guy. Um, you look up Dwayne Johnson's numbers at Miami down there when they were uh, the criminals down there. Um, he used to have that rivalry with Notre Dame for a while, the criminals against Catholics. Uh, that's a great documentary on ESPN if you watch that. Um, very interesting about those two teams for robbery. But yeah, Dwayne played down there. Uh, so that's a guy who likes the sport buying the sport. That's what I like. Well, just some guy who like, hey, that looks cool. I'll do it. No, he enjoys football. So Interesting. So that's all I've got for, uh, for sports. All right. The album of the week. Yes. All right, this week's album of the week is, is Van Halen this week, and it's the album 1984. 1984 was the sixth studio album by American hard rock band Van Halen, released January 9th, 1984. This is the final full-length album to feature all four original members of Van Halen. Now, this album sold 10 million copies. Um, once again, it came out in 1984, of course, recorded second half of 1983 in uh, the 5150 Studios in Studio City, California. Now, the first, because this is the sixth album, the first five for Van Halen were quickly recorded sometimes in several months or sometimes several weeks to get an album out. Uh, this one did take almost a year to create and produce and so they wanted to get it right. Um, and, but, but following the 1982 album called Diver Down, guitarist Eddie Van Halen was dissatisfied by the concessions he had to make to Van Halen frontman David Lee Roth and Warner Brothers producer Ted Templeman. Both discouraged Eddie from making keyboards a prominent instrument in the band's music. And so uh, he ended up, as we all know, this taking this album uh, featured about half uh, half keyboards and synthesizers and things like that on this album that really took it to the whole next level. But they fought back and forth uh, to do this. And this time, 
they got they agreed to meet halfway in the middle and that said we'll, we'll have heavy guitar sounds and we'll also have half the songs with some synths synthesizers and keyboards and it worked up well because the mixture of the keyboard heavy songs and the intense hard rock for which the band was known uh, that resulted in a compromise and it actually worked out well taking this to a whole nother level now in 1983 eddie van halen was in the process of building his own studios that's the one that he named 5150 now for the newer listeners out there 5150 is the california code law code for temporary and voluntary psychiatric commitment of individuals is the 5150 code and so they created that and while they were being installed while that uh, house was being built and the studio was being in, uh, set up and installed it gave Eddie a lot of time a lot of downtime to fiddle around with the synthesizer and he came up some, with some very good very good things on that that was actually used um, in the album now the artwork I've got it up here on the screen the album cover artwork the artwork was created by graphic artist Margot Nehas the band asked Nehas to create a cover that featured four chrome women. Four women in chrome is what they wanted. She goes, I, I don't know what to do with that. What am I gonna do? I, I got nothing, I got nothing for that. And so uh, she declined. But her husband, Nehas' husband, brought her a portfolio of some artwork, which included a child, a painting of, a, of uh, the same uh, child here stealing cigarettes. The band says, you know what, let's use that. And she said, I can get a child to get the photo taken. I got a very good friend of mine that's got a little boy. The boy's name is Carter Helm. Carter Helm is the boy featured in the photo. Uh, was a child of one of Nehas's best friends. She uh, photographed him holding a cigarette candy, candy cigarette. And, um, and then they featured it. So if you look it up, you know, it's Carter Helm was the actual model there. They put the cigarettes in front, which promptly, you know, made the censoring, I think in the UK, oh. they really put the stickers on this album because it's a child smoking uh, and everything else. But uh, once again, it got that, got that name out there because of all this yep. problems with the, uh, with the artwork. Um, and so that's what it was. So she uh, did get the job, but did not get the four Chrome women that they wanted. Now, the songs, track listing. And this is interesting because uh, there's only nine songs on the album. It's only 33 minutes long. But remember the first song, instrumental, that 1984 instrumental is only a minute long. So there's really eight songs on the album. Track one is 1984. Track two is Jump. Track three is Panama. The, uh, the song lyrics written by David Lee Roth was after he attended a, a motor raceway uh, race in Las Vegas. It was a, just a, a really good car there that he watched called, it was called the Panama Express at the Vegas Speedway. And he goes, I wanna make a song about that. And uh, so it's a, the lyrics are featured with the car automotive. In fact, they've got some uh, car accelerating with exhaust in the, in the middle of the song. I looked that up. That's the it was the actual exhaust uh, revving up of the engine of eddie van halen's lamborghini they attached he backed it up to the studio and attached uh, they attached the uh, audio microphones to the tailpipe and that's where you get this in the middle of the song it's a it's a lamborghini then the next song was top jimmy now, top jimmy the van halen did that song as a tribute to uh to james paul Koncheck. He was in the formerly the band, the Top Jimmy and the Rhythm Pigs. So they did a tribute to Top Jimmy and the Rhythm Pigs uh, for him. Song side, song five on top, uh, side one is Drop Dead Legs. Then song six is Hot for Teacher. That features, uh, you know, the music video for that that features the two models uh, posing as uh, school school teachers and the class would be applauding when they started stripping and everything. So this all, this is all big in 1984 MTV. Yes. And took that song over the top. Uh, one of those models was the runner up for the Miss Canada uh, competition in 1981. And the other, I think it was a physical education teacher was a former playmate of the year. 1976 was that other model. That's what I heard. Yes. Yes. 
<laughs> that's what you've heard. Uh, song seven is I'll Wait. I'll Wait is one of my favorite songs on the album. But David Lee Roth didn't want it on the album. They got done. They're ready to package the album. He says, I think that's a throwaway. Don't include it on the album. That's the I'll Wait. Well, the problem is he had a hard time coming up with the lyrics. So they bring in Michael McDonald. Oh, the wow. The lyrics on the song. Michael McDonald's credited uh, as a co-writer of the song I'll Wait from Van Halen. Uh, they, and they instead put it on the album and later released it as a single. But Roth at first didn't want it on the album at all. After that, it's uh, the final two songs are Girl Gone Bad and House of Pain. Now the personnel, of course, David Lee Roth on the vocals, Eddie Van Halen on guitars, keyboards, and background vocals, Michael Anthony on bass, background vocals, and Alex Van Halen, Van Halen drums only. So uh, some of the reviews of 1984, uh, it, it, Billboard did state that it was funnier and more versatile than some of the other you know, heavy metal groups that were out there. They, did, they threw in some comedy. They had a good time with it. Very strong album. Uh, Eddie Van Halen, in fact, just you know, died last fall. It was October 20th uh, when Eddie Van Halen died last fall. Now, the one thing I didn't know, see if you'll remember this, uh, Andy, as we close out the show here. To help promote the album, the band ran a contest on MTV called The Lost Weekend. Remember this? Yes, vaguely, yes. Fans, fans mailed in over one million postcards. You know, no, it, um, you know, no internet. In fact, they couldn't go online and sign up, so they mailed in postcards to try to win this Lost Weekend to promote the album. And uh, they sent it into MTV. David Lee Ross says, if the winner is going to go on this trip with us, and he says, you won't know where you are. You won't know what's going to happen. And when you come back, you're not going to have any memory of your weekend trip. <laughs> so they called it the Lost Weekend. That's awesome promotion. Uh, Kurt Jeffries, a gentleman from Detroit, won this and uh, was flown into Detroit to join the band for this uh, for this for this trip. Uh, uh, he was allowed to bring his best friend with. So uh, him and his best friend went on this lost weekend because they won the contest uh, and, and such. So that was all very good. Now, <clears throat> the album at the time, Michael Jackson's Thriller was out and it was still a number one on the charts. Uh, and this was in, eight, in 84. Van, Van Halen's 1984 comes up gets up as high as number two on the charts, but can't get over that Michael Jackson thriller. Now keep in mind, Eddie Van Halen recorded a, a song on that thriller album, uh, played the, the lead guitar on Beat It yep. on that album. And so uh, it, it got, uh, it remained up there, it peaked at number two and stayed there for five, five straight weeks. But uh, boy, it, uh, they had some good songs on that album. Uh, it was the fall. The album's singles that came out were the, the synthesizer-driven I'll Wait that we talked about. Panama mm -hmm. came out. Uh, each of those peaked at the Billboard uh, number 13 on the charts. And then Hot for Teacher was a moderate Billboard 100 success, only reaching 56. But the MTV video even made the song more popular. Um, yep. The video, by the way, was directed by David Lee Roth, of course. Oh, yeah. And... Um, he had to do that. So that was some, those were some fun years with some fun albums, but I didn't know also, Andy, the first, um, you know, the first albums that they put together were very quick. They didn't spend much time. One, one album in, in fact was recorded in five days, but when they got to this one called 1984, they spent a, a year focusing, getting everything set, but they still had those differences. And I think it was no more band after this, uh, Van Halen and the original members, uh, weren't around after this, uh, after this record. Yeah, the one that I wanted to throw out real quick was, and a lot of them were cover songs on that album too. Yep. This is one of the first albums they did without a cover song on it. Yeah, not a um, cover song at all. So, um, yeah. The one thing I heard about the song Jump that uh, David Lee Roth was saying is, he was watching the news in LA, 
about some guy on a bridge who was going to jump. So that's where we got the thing, might as well jump. That, that, is, that is correct. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman was waffling on that yep. bridge deciding whether to jump or not, and he got a kick out of that, of course, and decided to write some lyrics for it. But that's uh, what, what that is about. And then there was something on the, the jump, the, the music video. He did a tribute to his martial arts instructor on that. Yes. Because he did a lot of work with uh, martial arts and training to get uh, to be able to do all the theatrics on stage but uh, mm -hmm. fun band to watch but that was 1984 so that's what i've got uh 33 minutes long uh, sent out from warner brothers and um good stuff now one other thing here i don't know that what tour it was but um close family friend you know him as sky shark yes uh, one backstage tickets to a Van Halen concert for a drawing he made of the band. Oh, really? So close circuit to Sky Shark. If you can get a picture of that to us, we'll put it on the site. But yeah, he he's a big he's Van Halen's sun rises and sets on them, boy. Well, that's good to know. That's very interesting. Maybe we can get that in yeah. and and show that because the backstage. Yeah, if you can send that in this week. We'll put it up. Yeah, I'm sure he's got some good stories and tell tales from that uh, event backstage yes. as well. Well, if the I lawyers think, would love to talk about it. And I think the when they got back together was it 2007 when uh, Wolfgang Van Halen was playing guitar. They yeah. came to the Excel Energy Center. I did see that. That's the only time I ever saw Van Halen was 2007 with Ed, with uh, Wolfgang. The son. Wolf, Wolfie. Wolfie and uh, Roth, David Lee Roth uh, leading up the, uh, the charge. But that was Excel Energy Center, I think, in 2007 when they had that reunion. It's kind of funny. If you look online now, I don't know if I put the stores on our page or not. Um, Sammy Hager has some stuff coming up lately saying how uh, there was legal actions when he joined the, the band. They almost had to legally change the name to Van Hagar. And he said if they would have, he wouldn't have been in the band. He wouldn't have done it. Because that's one of the few bands, you think about it, unless it's like nowadays touring like Styx Tours Now or Foreigner where the bands all change except for like two guys in it. Very rarely do you change a lead singer and still have success. Um, well, last week I did the review on Saliva, and I yeah. found out now that they're back together. In fact, they're going to be touring, I think, this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, but they they can uh, Josie Scott the lead singer 15 years ago so they've got another guy yeah uh, a bunch of I think other other members of the band there's only a couple originals maybe left in there but the name is still the same same songs they play too so. yep yep because you look at Van Halen but when Sammy took over I, I liked both bands but it was a different band when Sammy take, took over when Gary Sharon took over after that they sounded a lot more like Extreme which is where Gary Sharon came from. Because it's the voice is what carries the band mm -hmm. more than the sound. If you listen to uh, Slaughter, a lot of their stuff. Mark Slaughter. Mark Slaughter. He was the original lead singer in the Vinnie Vincent Invasion. Him and Dana Strum, the bass player, were in that band. So you kind of hear some similarities there. Um, ACDC, when Brian Johnson took over from Bon Scott, that's a different sound. Still, yes. both... Highway to Hell and Back in Black, both great albums. You know, two different singers, but a little different sound. Brian Johnson's got a little different sound because you don't want someone to try to mimic the guy before you. That's, unless, of course, you're Journey and you find some young Korean kid in a tribute band that tries to sound like Steve Perry, then it's okay. Well, there was but, a, an interview I listened to when I was doing my research for this. Uh, Eddie Van Halen did t tell someone in an interview that the song Girl Gone Bad on this album, Girl Gone Bad, was written in a hotel room that he is, and his then wife Valerie Bertinelli had rented. That this uh, song, this, uh, uh, this riff came to him in the middle of the night. Well, he didn't want to wake up Valerie Bertinelli, who was sleeping in the hotel room bed. And so it says here that get an idea to put on tape, but he didn't want to wake her. So he grabbed a cassette recorder and recorded himself playing the guitar in a closet. <laughs> so that's where the, uh, the riff girl gone bad came from. It came to him in the middle of the night and, um, and he recorded it in a closet in a hotel. Now I know growing up watching Valerie Bertinelli on TV and that 
helped make Eddie Van Halen a hero of mine growing up, knowing that he married Valerie Bertinelli. That's a little side note there for you. Well, it, it is because uh, I, I found out over the years uh, as well that there, a lot of women were attracted to Eddie, and I thought that he was kind of a, a, an, an ugly-looking nerd dude, but very right. good, talented. I didn't, I didn't think he was ever attractive. Uh, no. You know, women would consider him attractive, but as an adult now, looking back, I've had this conversation with other women, and many found him extremely attractive, which blew me away. I said, you got David Lee Roth in the front of the band. Right. Uh, you know, he's your, he's your centerfold guy. No, no, yep. I like Eddie. I said, really? Yeah, I, I, I got nothing. I, I, I never could understand that piece. So maybe listeners watching this show here can uh, leave some comments in the, disc, in the uh, comments section. But, uh, and poor Mark Anthony left off to the side again. Well, he was funny. He was funny to watch that guy, Mike Anthony, Michael Anthony. And you look at him now with Sammy Hagar's band, the man hasn't aged. Hair's a little thinner, but he's still same build, same guy, same, same Michael Anthony. He had some fun. He had some fun. He, uh, the, the bass player gets very, is a very underrated band, and uh, he kind of helped make that more of a special thing because him and Alex together, the bass player and the drummer, are the key to a good sound. And those two had it going so well. It was, it was sad. Was not a rip on Wolfie, but just Michael Anthony and Alex just kind of had a click there, I thought. Very good stuff. Uh, that's all I've got for that. Anything more on today's show? Uh, no, just uh, concerts are coming back. I just heard today um, at, the, at the Greenhouse, U.S. Bank Stadium, George Strait is we play in there. Um, but a lot of these bands that like they said on that story, they're wanting to book their dates out farther because they don't know how many fans they can get in. You don't want to book U.S. Bank Stadium and have only a third of the people can show up. I mean, they're still pushing the Def Leppard Motley Crue concert there. They're still promoting that. But what U.S. Bank said is before you send your nasty letters to anybody, it's the promoters that are canceling the shows, not the stadiums. Because the promoters oh, are like, right. yes, I'm not right. going to fly everybody in for a third of capacity. Um, if you had tickets like the Def Leppard Motley Crue concert from last year, they're still good. Guy at Ticket King was saying, prices are going to elevate a lot online because – it's not if only a third of the people could get in. Well, geez, not many people could see it. That's some people are gonna think tickets more expensive that way, then, or it's more chance to see. So, be careful if you're gonna buy tickets online for any concerts coming up, um, especially if they said they had it from before. Not that Ticket King doesn't try to make money on it, Ticket King or any of the other online services. I'd rather get that buy tickets through that than through uh, the guy selling it on his own site. You know, go through a broker, go through StubHub, something where they can track it to make sure it's an official ticket. Because you're going to see a lot of fake and phony bad tickets coming up here, I think, with uh, scalpers. So be careful. Public service yeah. announcement. It's true. There's a lot of, you'll, you'll know when you log in and you see the ticket prices, you know, uh, yep. three, four, five hundred dollars at something, something ain't right. So, yeah, yep. no offense, no one's that good. <laughs> All right, that's all we got for today, episode number 21. Thanks for listening, and uh, please leave your requests and comments down below. Yep, thank you for uh, Tuesdays on Instagram for page two. Dan has baseball specials Wednesday on YouTube. So we'll see yeah, you guys sure next those, week. Uh, check those things out. We'll see you next week. Bye.